everyone. This is an incredible space. I think it's the most beautiful place I've ever read. Um, um, thank you, all of you, so much for being here. It's so wonderful to read to a great big group like this with cocktails. Um, and thank you, Elise and Jane and Nina, for putting together this fantastic event. I'm going to read just a little bit from my new novel called The Big Bang Symphony. This is a, a story about three women, all of whom who take jobs in Antarctica. Um, Rosie goes down there as a galley cook. Um, Michaela goes down as a, she's with the Artists and Writers Program. She's a composer. She's going to compose some music about Antarctica, but she actually has a secret mission, which is to spy on her father, who's a physicist at the South Pole. Um, he doesn't know she's there. He left her mother before she, she was born, so they don't, he doesn't actually know who she is. I um, mean, the third character who I'm going to read a little bit about tonight is Alice, and she's a climate change geologist. Um, she just thinks in terms of um, evidence and data, pretty much. Um, I wrote this book because I love wild spaces, and they're really, um, um, wilderness is a, it, it tr transforms me. It's a real agent for change in my life. And so often when people write about um, wild places like Antarctica, they write about conquering them or being conquered by it, rather than a place that can actually change people. Um, I've been to Antarctica three times, um, and I find it just does radical things to the people down there. I loved mm -hmm. hanging out in the communities of people. They're just really, really intense, raw places, and the people there sort of respond from a very intense, raw place. So it was really a way to see who we are as humans at our very elemental place. So I'm going to read just a little bit um, from the Alice character. She's the geologist. She's 28 years old. Um, she has a very dependent mother. She's really had trouble leaving her mother. You'll see why in a minute. Um, she is in a very ambiguous relationship with her PhD advisor, a man named Rasmussen, who is bringing her down to Antarctica to work with him. Um, and, and this scene takes place after she, she's just arrived a couple days ago at McMurdo Station. And she's just spent the morning on the ice with a seal biologist, a guy named Jamie. And there was a lot of chemistry between them. <coughs> Alice went directly to Crary Lab and let herself into Rasmussen's office. She'd be with him soon. Though the mountains were bound to, bound to be more daunting than the road between McMurdo Station and Scott Bay, she, whoops, sorry, she'd have work, and work was salvation. She sat in Rasmussen's chair and laid her fingers on his keyboard. This was where she belonged, not walking across a frozen sea with an overzealous biologist. What had she been thinking? Relieved to have righted herself, Alice punched her mother's number. Oh, Alice, this isn't a good time. Can I call you back? No, I can call out, but we can't get calls in unless it's an emergency. Believe me, it is. Now? Right now an emergency? What's wrong, Mom? I can't believe you didn't leave a way for me to get in touch with you. You don't know what I've been through the last few days. Alice felt as if a vacuum were sucking her heart out through her feet. We talked yesterday, Mom. You were fine. I don't want to alarm you. What? You know what, I'm not well. You knew that when you left. The doctor said you were fine. He said the CAT scan showed nothing. He didn't say I was fine. <laughs> I know fine and this isn't it. Could you come home just for a few days? <laughs> I'm in Antarctica. Antarctica, her mother exhaled the word as if Alice had said she was in the gulag. Do you have a headache? Alice asked. Well, you know I do. Well, what about the Percodan? If it were only the headache, I could deal. What else then, Mom? I can't do this. Do what? Life. Alice didn't mean for her voice to come out in a whisper, but it did. I can't come home. She heard the fridge door shutting, the clink of the book. Whoops. <laughs> The clink of the bottle being set down on the ceramic tiles of the kitchen countertop. The pop of the cork, as if her mother were exaggerating the sound effects for her benefit. A moment later, a full-body sigh that probably followed a long drink. Of course you can't come home, but you're so good to call. Tell me, how's Rasmussen treating you? I haven't seen him yet. He's in the field. He sounds like such a character, taciturn, rough, a low chuckle. Not really rough. He's exacting. He's very focused on his work. Mary? They'd had this conversation before, but if it comforted her mother, they could have it again. No, he's not married. An affair with some young thing in the department? I don't think so. Oh, come on now. Don't tell me you spent all those evenings in the lab and nothing happens. Even scientists have libidos. I think he's very shy. 
Well, then what about his scientific rival? Does he have a wife? You mean Morrison? Whoever, sure, Morrison. Does Morrison have a wife? I think so. Well, maybe, maybe Rasmussen fancies Morrison's wife. I don't think so. Why'd she call her mother? To stop the free fall she'd felt in her morning with Jamie, and it was working. But you told me they have a fiery dispute about geology, Mom. Morrison basically believes that the earth has warmed and cooled and the ice sheets have melted and frozen several times in recent geological history. But Rasmussen thinks, trust me, her mother interrupted, their dispute is about something more than rocks. You do know it's not about rocks, don't you? <laughs> there has to be something else, something in their personalities, if not in their personal lives. What makes them so opposed to each other? The real fire in every dispute is always something deeply human, utterly personal. Tell me you know that, Alice. No one is sleeping with anyone's wife. Then Rasmussen got turned down by the other's university. Or what about this? One of them got published more prestigiously than the other. So many evenings her mother had tried to engage her in this kind of speculation, longing for Alice to tell her something juicy, and she often wished she could make something up. But Alice was not good at inventing stories. She could only examine the evidence, all of which, in the case of Rasmussen or Morrison, pointed to, do, to the dispute being about rocks and ice, just rocks and ice. Maybe, Alice told her mother, I don't really know the history of their relationship. Well, what about you then? Is there something between you and Rasmussen? When Alice didn't answer, her mother said, aha, you could do worse than a college professor. <laughs> Alice hesitated. She knew it was pointless to remind her mother that Alice herself was a college professor. <laughs> or would be soon if she made it through these couple of months of field work. And to do that, she had to placate her mother. So she conceded, I don't know yet. Nothing's been said. Well, what does he look like? He's maybe 50. You should introduce him to me. <laughs> Not your type, Mom. Oh, well, so maybe you'll meet some handsome man your own age in Antarctica. Age doesn't matter that much. You don't want to be alone in your old age, Alice, like me. You're not even 50. Trust me, Alice, 30 is old for a woman. I better go. Don't worry about me. Study your rocks. Look for a man. Have a good time. <laughs> Hanging up felt so much easier than Alice thought it should. She sat in Rasmussen's office for another half hour, surfing the net and flipping through familiar geology texts, grounding herself in his mineral world. Thanks.